Good to go? All right. All right. Third day in a row. Woohoo. So we have, believe it or not, finished what the book calls physics. All right, so give yourself a hand for phys finishing physics. All right. However, we're going into chemistry, which really at this point is still physics. <laughs> so chemistry, as I think I mentioned from the beginning of the year, is really a, I call it applied physics. Because basically, it's taking the, the laws of physics. Hey, Nicholas. Just a couple minutes. Uh, it's taking physics and saying, all right, Let's go into how atoms interact with each other and molecules interact with each other. But really, you can always break it down into physics, especially when we're talking about atoms. And um, we're going to get into the periodic table. A lot of it at this point is still physics. And you can probably con keep considering it that for a while. At the end of the class today, we're going to talk about um, some nuclear uh, fission and fusion. And that really, to me, is all physics, although chemists might disagree with that. So anyway. It's so going to be a somewhat gradual transition in, in that sense. But we're going to start out today talking about atoms and this thing called the periodic table, which you have all heard about, if not taken a specific class on. But I just wanted to start out with uh, this little phrase that uh, actually Carl Sagan once famously said in a, uh, in a movie, in, in a, or a film rather, that he, that he had. He uh, used to do a uh, he's actually uh, unfortunately passed away in the, I guess, the 90s, I think, or maybe the early 2000s. Uh, I think the 90s. And he uh, had a, he was an astronomer, famous astronomer, uh, and had a show called Cosmos, which I think might still be on Netflix. So if you guys happen to have Netflix or anything like that, it's on there. And you should watch it because it's an awesome show. And it's really not that dated, even though it was done in like the 80s. Um, so it's a very good show. But anyway. He basically said, we are all star stuff. Here's what that means, OK? Most atoms in the universe are actually hydrogen atoms, OK? One proton, one electron, that's it, OK? 90% of the atoms in the universe, as far as we know, and we can't see the whole universe with our telescopes, but from what we can see uh, of the atoms, and this is actually matter, not dark matter, which you might have heard before, but matter, hydrogen, OK? formed uh, 14 billion years ago when the universe formed. Uh, we're not sure why that happened or how that happened, but we're getting there. Um, and hydrogen itself, when it clumps together because of gravity, forms stars. Okay? And if you get enough, if you get enough hydrogen together, uh, the star that's formed is actually a giant nuclear fusion reactor. And it's caused by jamming hydrogen so close together that they fuse together and actually create the next highest atom, which is helium, okay? which has two protons, actually has two neutrons, and some electrons, okay? and generally, four, uh, generally two as well. But uh, the helium also starts to get compressed down together, starts fusing together. And then when it fuses together, it creates, I think it creates lithium, which is the next one. But I'm not exactly sure exactly how it all works, but I think it must. All of the atoms are created that way. At least all the naturally occurring atoms are created in these stars. All the carbon molecules in your body, all the oxygen molecules we breathe, all the uh, other metals and um, other types of particles that we, t our atoms we talk about, created in stars. Okay? Every atom in your body and the rest of the universe came from this star furnace. Right, which is kind of cool. So when Carl Sagan says, hey, we are all star stuff, you can really think of it that way. And you go, whoa, the atoms that are in me and in everything else that we see came from a star at one point. Pretty cool, huh? All right, kind of neat. Some things we create these days, we do create things like plutonium, which isn't generally created. Nat well, it's created somewhat naturally. But um, some other atoms we do create naturally. But the stuff that's in you right now came from stars. Pretty cool. Okay. When we talk about chemistry, you have to think about these things called atoms. We've just been kind of talking about a couple. Atoms are very, 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 very small. And I probably should use a lot more varies in there because they're tiny. Okay? Every time you exhale, 10 billion trillion atoms come out in your breath. Okay? That's a number that big, which is a lot. 
<laughs> okay? In fact, it's pretty much true that the air you breathe, some of the atoms in your body were actually in every other person in, in the world's body at some point or another. Okay? Because there's so many atoms out there, and when you breathe, 10 billion, trillion of them get exhaled into the atmosphere, and you breathe a lot, right? And so that's in and out and in and out, and they get, kind of get spread around the world. The odds are you have some of Einstein's atoms that he breathed in, in your body, right? And Newton's and every other historical figure you can think of. Okay, which is kind of cool, all right? But they're so sm atoms are so small, we can't even see them with any kind of microscope that's based on light. We talked about, during the light chapter, we talked about the frequencies of light, right? Frequencies as you go higher and higher and higher of visible light, okay, max out at some like, what's the highest color? Blue, violet, I guess. And those rays, the, the wavelength is actually too big to bounce off an atom and then go into your eye, no matter how much you magnify it. It's impossible to see it using light. So we have other methods for kind of, quote, seeing atoms, but it's not based on light-based microscopes. There's other things called electron microscopes and um, scanning, tunneling microscopes. And there's another one in the book. I forget what it's called. I think I have a slide on that one. But atoms are actually really tiny. Of course, atoms aren't the smallest thing, right? We've actually got subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, electrons, right? Protons and neutrons are in the middle. Electrons are in the uh, outside uh, of the atom, kind of in this cloud around the atom, right? Electrons are actually tiny, believe it or not, compared to the protons and neutrons, which are already small to begin with. I've got some other um, ways of explaining this here. Atoms, though, are actual. So, so yeah, I know you've already looked at this, but if you think about an atom, right, and you think about the protons and the neutrons and the electrons, what's between the protons and the electrons? No, on the neutron, let's say it's just a hydrogen. It's got one proton, one electron. What's between that proton and that electron? Space. Empty space. space. Complete emptiness, right? And because of the size of atoms relative to the, uh, to the actual uh, size of the particles, if an atom was the size of a baseball stadium, right, and which is kind of, you know, you know, the size of a baseball stadium, right, the nucleus would be this big right in the middle somewhere, the grape, grape sized, right? And an electron, even though this isn't quite correct because you can't really say an electron has a size, but if you, if you want to think about it, you could say the electron is actually the size of a grain of salt. So a hydrogen atom makes up 90% of the matter in the universe. If it were the size of a baseball stadium, you'd have a grape in, or sorry, a, yeah, a grape in the middle and one piece of salt somewhere around the stadium. And, that's, and everything else is empty. And there's atoms next to each other and, they, and all that. So that's the scale that we're talking about. Okay? Remember how we talked about how, uh, how impressively large the electromagnetic force is? All this empty space, the reason you can't put your hands right through the, each other is because even though your hands are mostly empty, mostly completely empty, right? You can't put them between, be, you can't knock them against or put them between or through each other rather because there's the electric force keeping your uh, atoms apart. Okay, pretty cool. You had a question, Tyler. Are we going to ask the size difference between protons and neutrons? The size difference between protons and neutrons. Good question. Protons are about 2,000 times more massive. Okay, 2,000 times more massive. Size-wise, again, you can't really say how large an electron is. But if you think about it, a grape versus a, a, a piece of salt or a grain of salt, it's probably you know the right frame of mind to put it in. That's the difference there, okay? But they have the same charge. They do have the same charge, which is interesting. Okay, they each have one charge. Electrons happen to be negative one, protons happen to be positive one. And by the way, those aren't the only particles. There's like tens of, like dozens of particles out there. There's also positrons, which are positive electrons. Hmm. There's actually, uh, there's, what do we call the positive, so we've got the positive electrons and we've got negative protons, I guess they're called antiprotons, I think those are what those are called, which are actually negative protons. When a negative proton, or when a, when a positron hits an electron, they completely annihilate each other. And you just get two beams of light. Well, I guess a photon or two of light out of that. It's called uh, annihilation. What's that? So 
God matter and angels and demons? God matter. I'm not I'm not sure what that is, but but it's but there there are these other particles. And there's also particles. There's eta particles. And there's muons and there's pions and there's all these different particles. We are not going to get into those details. But suffice it to say that physicists have been very busy over the last 50 or 100 years discovering a lot of these particles. And they discover really cool ones. There's also one called a neutrino. There are billions of neutrinos flying right through your body right now. And all those neutrinos are going straight through the Earth and flying out the other side, not touching anything. Just like that. They're just going right through. What's the line theory? Is it the what? Line theory. Line theory? I'm not, you mean string theory? It's not string theory, it's just it's, it's another particle. But the particles are so tiny, they're basically massless, and they have no charge, and because there's mostly empty space, it's like, it's like saying, oh, I have this uh, bullet I'm going to shoot through the baseball stadium. You think I'm going to hit that grape in the middle or that, that happen to hit that grain of salt? No, the odds are very, very slim, which is what neutrinos do all the time. They go straight through the Earth, straight through Sun, straight through whatever. They mostly come from stars. but. Uh, they go straight through them. We do have ways of figuring out if they're there or not by measuring them. Basically, that involves a giant detector either way underwater or way underneath ice in like the South Pole or something. So there's no other particles that kind of can get that deep. And we, we can measure them uh, to, a, to a certain extent if they're there. So very cool stuff. So atoms are made of a lot of different particles. Okay, The ones that we generally talk about, well, the ones that they're made of are the neutrons, protons, and electrons. But neutrons and protons are made of other particles too and all that. So it's very interesting stuff when it comes down to it. But anyway, point is, atoms don't pass through each other, even though they're all empty, because of the electric field. Okay? All right. And hopefully in that lab last night, you guys got to feel the third lab. You got to feel for like how much, how hard it is to get an electron to go, or something positive to go past a negative or whatever. It's really hard to do. So that's what it is. Trial and error. Trial and error is a, a good way to do it. OK, so once we talk about atoms, we start to talk about elements. OK, and you, the elements are any material that has just one type of atom is what we call an element. OK, hydrogen gas is an, is an element. Hydrogen is an element because it's just made up of hydrogen. Helium, lithium, gold, iron, all those kinds of things. OK, aluminum. All right, all that stuff is uh, are elements. Okay, things that aren't elements. Steel is not an element. It's actually a mixture. Well, I guess it's a what do they call it? an alloy of different elements. Okay, other things. Yeah, um, iron is a. Oh, you know, iron's a metal. Oxygen's got some oxygen in there and so forth. Yeah, Tom. Now, do they take uh, the names from Latin? Some of them. Because they did. Is a yeah, yeah go, the symbol, which we'll get to in a minute, the symbol for some of the uh, elements, they do get some of those from Latin, um, maybe some from Greek, I'm not even sure. But some of them they just make up. There's an element called uh, Einsteinium, yeah. right? Which they just made up because they just wanted to name it after Einstein, right? So, you know, they just make some of them up. Okay? Um, we know of about 90 different elements that are actually found in nature. Okay? Most. Uh, most of the periodic table is found in nature. Remember, all created in stars, right? We have, there's about 20 more that we've actually created in the laboratory, which is pretty cool. Okay, we create new elements. Most of the ones that we make in the laboratory are gone before we know it. They've got such a short half-life, what we call it, that they just degrade into other, uh, other atoms uh, almost instantly. But uh, you, could make, you could make up your own name if you end up figuring out what one of those is. Okay? We have this thing called the periodic table, which we'll get to in a, we'll kind of spend a good bit of time tonight on the periodic table. And uh, the first periodic table is kind of odd. This guy, Mendeleev, uh, came up with it, quote, first. But there was another guy who also came up with it about the same time. People were thinking about this stuff. Periodic table is basically how do you categorize elements? Okay, it's pretty cool stuff. Aha, and here it is. Okay, you've all seen this, right? This is a very, uh, famous picture or a famous uh, table, okay? And we'll get into the details of this, but there's, uh, on this one, there's 103 listed, okay? And we'll talk about how this is actually set up in a minute. But the first thing I want to do is show you a little video. Some of you may have heard it before. It's called the Element Song. And if you memorize it, you'll know all the elements. Well, except for like the last 20, which they only came up with recently. 
So let's see, let me plug this in. This is a guy by, by a guy named Tom Lehrer. Anybody heard of him before? No, Let. yeah, Lehrer. That was Letterer. Song, song's been along for a, around for a long time. Hopefully, you've probably heard, heard it before. Some of you have, anyway. Okay, uh, let's see. Some guy put, oops, full screen. Some guy put this to uh, a little flash animation here, too. Those are the ones that were discovered since the song. Okay, did you get all that? Quiz on uh, after the break? You can name five. I bet you can name more than five. Uh, let's see. What's that? That is, uh, I got that on, yeah, I found it on YouTube or something. No, I found it online. Just, I, I'm going to put it, I'll put a link on the website, but you can do it there. Um, I am not going to make you memorize this, obviously. Okay, that's ridiculous. Some things about it you'll need to know, uh, but you won't need to memorize things. I mean, you'll definitely need to know that hydrogen's the, the number, the uh, least massive element, and you'll have to know something else about the table itself, but not the details uh, as far as memorizing these things. By the way, there are some um, elements here that have default names because we haven't figured out exactly who we should credit them to, who gets to name them. But most of them. It has been that way for a while. I think they've actually named some of these very recently. I think some of the list on that list might have been named very recently. But we'll get into more of the periodic table in a little bit. Okay, um, so we already went through some of this. Protons, 2,000 times more massive than electrons. Okay, they're the ones in the nucleus of the atom. Well, one of the things in the nucleus. Okay, the number of protons is equal to the number of electrons surrounding the nucleus in an atom that's not an ion. In other words, an ion being an atom that has fewer or greater number of electrons. Okay? <clears throat> but generally, the, in order to balance the charge, you have to have the same number of electrons, same number of protons. Neutrons, which are actually just a little bit bigger than protons, okay, have no charge at all. And they are also in the, nu in the nucleus. Okay? Protons and neutrons are called nucleons because they occur, you know, they are found inside the nucleus. Okay? Don't get protons and nuclei or neutrons and nucleons confused. Protons and neutrons are both nucleons because they have they are found in the nucleus. Okay? We've got this thing called the atomic number. Okay, the atomic number, very easy to remember, it's the number of protons. Full stop. If it has seven protons, its atomic number is seven. Hydrogen, one proton, atomic number one. Helium, two protons, atomic number three of two. Lithium, three protons, atomic number three, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Okay, and you can find all this information on the periodic table. You gotta know where to look, but it's pretty easy if you just remember that. Okay, hydrogen, one proton, one, got it. Okay. There are also these things called isotopes. Okay. And we've also got this, this idea of atomic mass. Atoms themselves do not have to have the same number of neutrons all the time. Okay? You've actually got three different types of hydrogen atoms that, we, that are naturally occurring. One is the regular old hydrogen atom that has no neutrons. Okay? We also have hydrogen 2, which is called deuterium, which has one neutron. And the reason it's two is because its mass is two. See how the, we call, we, we make it easy. And we say that a proton's got a mass of one and a neutron has a mass of one. So the total mass is two. So we call this hydrogen two. And there's also something called tritium, which is hydrogen three, which means it has one proton and two neutrons. Okay? Which part of this tells me that it's hydrogen? The one proton. So if it's only got one proton, it is hydrogen. And its atomic, mass, or atomic number is one. OK, so that's how we know that. But these are all isotopes, and they are all somewhat naturally occurring. It's probably true that right now, well, I don't know about right now, because hydrogen is not that much, not much in air. But hydrogen threes, you've been exposed to them at some point. They're not deadly. They're not, you know, not going to 
uh, they are radioactive to an extent, but um, they're not you know, deadly because of other reasons. Um, but these are actually used in uh, optics. optics? Nope. Oh, all right. I didn't know that. I know they're used in fusion bombs, like the H bomb. But um, in fact, that's one of the problems. You have to continuously refill the tritium in these uh, like nuclear missiles because it, it's got a fairly short half-life, which we'll get to a little bit later. But anyway, it can't go higher than three. Uh, in hydrogen, I don't think there are any higher than three. There might be, well, but there it, other elements that can go higher. Absolutely, we'll talk about that. But and it, and it generally, generally, the number of protons is close to the number of neutrons. It turns out that in general they're close. In other words, if you've got a hundred protons you're probably going to have around 100 neutrons. Not necessarily exactly, but you're going to have around that. We'll get to why that's the case in a little bit as well. Okay. All right, a little bit more on isotopes. Atoms are inherently electrical in nature. Chemistry is an electrical science, believe it or not. It's all based on how atoms interact electrically, like what, like what we said before, when you talk about the chemical properties. Okay. Neutrons are not, remember they have no charge. So what that means is that they don't affect the chemical properties of an atom. So if you have more neutrons, it's not going to make a difference chemically. Okay? Unless there's some chemical property that has to do with the mass, which doesn't really occur for, for all intents and purposes for chemistry itself. Okay? What, that really, what that means in general is, for instance, sugar. Okay, is mainly car is actually made of carbon. Okay, most carbon is this carbon 13, which means it has six protons and seven neutrons. Okay, most of that is regular. Old, that's what m regular sugar is normally made of, carbon 13. Some, actually, it might be carbon 12. I might be wrong. I might be backwards on this one. Carbon, it doesn't, doesn't really matter for my, my point here. Carbon-12 is also, in the, in the same form, is also sugar. Okay? And guess what? They're digested exactly the same. If it's got seven neutrons or six neutrons, it's digested exactly the same. Okay? So what, that, what it means practically is it doesn't matter what the isotopes are. It'll behave the same chemically. Okay? On the periodic table, We've also got this thing called the atomic mass, which basically adds up the protons plus the neutrons, because that's the most massive part. We ignore the electrons, by the way. And what we do is we say, all right, how much of the normally occurring isotopes are this isotope? How much are this? And we average it together, and that'll give you the mass. And we'll see an example of that in a little bit. But it's based on how much naturally occurs. Okay? So that's kind of constantly we're refining that number. OK. We will be using these symbols occasionally in class here. OK. Anyone know what this symbol is, Fe? Iron. Iron, Iron. right? Uh, we talked about, yeah, ferrous or um, ferromagnetic materials, right? Iron-based. OK. We've got a little atomic symbol. Some are based on Latin. Some are based on the university where they were discovered. Some are based on famous people, whatever. Right? We've got an atomic symbol. Then we have the mass number. We already know that the mass, the, well, sorry, we, then we've got the atomic number, which we already know is the number of protons. protons. Okay? The atomic number is the number of protons. The mass number, which we generally round when we're talking kind of in general, okay, is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So in this case, we get. The, we know that 26 is the number of protons. We know that the mass number is 56. How would we figure out the number of neutrons? 56 minus 26, which in this case is 30. So remember, it's about the same amount. 26 protons, 30 neutrons in this case. So would you call that yeah. iron 56? You would call that iron 56, yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay. On the periodic table, you'll see it a little bit differently. The numbers happen to be kind of flipped. You'll generally see the atomic number up in the corner here. And by the way, it goes to boom, 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 boom. You'll know that directly because it'll go 26, 27, 28. Atomic number's up here. And sometimes they give this little number. You can't, probably can't see it on tape, but it's 55.847. That's where you get all this rounding effect. So most 
iron is iron 56, so it's close to 56. But some must be iron 55, so there's a, they round it and they average everything together. Yeah, James? Uh, what, what would happen if like, you had, uh, say, like 20 protons in there and 10 protons in there? If you had 20 protons and 40 or 50 neutrons, you just said it's usually around the same. they're usually around the same. If you could create an atom that had 20 protons and what, what was it, 60, as you say? Like 20 happens to be calcium. So that would mean you'd have calcium, and I don't have the actual how much it is there, but you'd have a very unstable calcium because too many pro neutrons makes it unstable and the atom wants to give up some of those neutrons so it, it radiates them away and it becomes unstable. Okay? So yeah, so you could try to do that stuff, but you could try to create more a atoms with more neutrons, but you'll end up at a point where it just becomes unstable and you know, it's not really an atom if it doesn't hold together for some amount of time. Okay? But good question. Okay? By the way, chemistry is a very, very old science. Uh, you guys may have heard of alchemists and alchemy where they tried to turn lead into gold, yeah. right? Because they, people thought that if you mix something together, blah, 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 you could get lead into gold. And lead was all over the place. And there wasn't so much gold. But if you had more gold, you could be more rich. And so people tried to do this. Newton was a famous alchemist. You know, did all this stuff with physics and real science and then kind of dabbled in this, this kind of chemistry that wasn't going anywhere in some sense. But OK, ready? Atomic number, number of protons, protons in the nucleus, electrons in a neutral atom, both of the above, none of the above. Definitely the protons. What about electrons? What did we say about a normal atom? Is it, well, for, think, look at the question, protons and electrons. Most atoms are neutral. If you've got 10 protons, how many electrons do you need to be neutral? So 10. So would the atomic number also tell you the electrons in a neutral atom? Absolutely. Well, it's however many happen to, protons you happen to have. So, yeah, in this case it is both the above. So, oh, three. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I thought you meant three, like, <laughs> yes. So it would be three, both of the above, okay? When the atomic number doesn't match the number of electrons, then it's an ion. And you see they're stripped away electrons or it's got extra electrons for some reason, okay? And we'll get into lots of that stuff coming up later as we go along. Okay, here's another check question. Nucleus, 44 for the atomic number and a mass number of 100. How many neutrons does it have? 56. Add them together and you get the mass number. There you go. Okay. Again, don't get neutron and nucleon mixed up. Um, of the 100 nuclei, nucleons and nucleus, 56 are neutrons in that case. Okay. All right. All right, back to the periodic table for a little bit. Periodic table is, as I said, a way to categorize different types of atoms. Okay? And if you'll notice, it's, it's kind of funny looking. Okay? And the, the reason it's funny looking like this is because at, over time, as people have figured out the properties of atoms, they started to realize, hey, some of these atoms behave really similarly to some other atoms. And they started putting them into these groups. Okay? And in fact, if you go down, these are called groups. So group 18 happens to be these gases over here, which we actually call Nobel gases, or noble gases, I should say. Okay? And they're called noble gases because, well, I guess the idea is they're much like royalty in that they don't like to mingle with anybody else. Right? Helium and neon and argon, they don't like to actually make element or make molecules with any of the other ones. They're kind of on their own. They're really tough to uh, to make them, to force them to make it other uh, molecules. They just like to kind of hang out on their own. Okay? Helium gases, group 18. And they're grouped that way because they all have the same properties. Okay? You've all taken a helium balloon and like breathed it in, right? Okay? You can do the same thing with neon and argon and whatever. These happen to be getting heavier and heavier. If you do the same thing with xenon, you actually end up, instead of your voice sounding like way higher, it sounds really low. It's kind of cool. I think uh, one of the guys from Mythbusters did it on, uh, on TV. Pro the other only problem with that is it tends to sink down. So you end up, um, if you breathe too much of it in, it sinks down and like, pushes all the oxygen out, and then you die. But you, know, you don't want to do that too much. And then there's radon. 
Anybody live in a place that has a basement, like back in the States? If you live in a house with a basement, sometimes you have to worry about radon, which is actually a radioactive noble gas. And it sinks down pretty low as well and tends to sit in your basement and like sit there. So if you don't have good ventilation and you live in certain parts of the country, you can worry about that. You can get a little test for it. Okay? And yeah? The six and seven period subset down there, uh -huh. 71 and 103 fall into the 18th group? Uh, they do not. We'll talk about that in a minute. They're actually in their own groups, believe it or not. But So the groups go this way, which are chemical properties that are very similar. Okay. The periods are going this way. And what distinguishes a period is if you're in the fifth period, well, it's basically when the chart starts over again, like into the chemical properties that, that are back for uh, the chemical properties that are um, for the one above it. So something in the fourth period, they're going to be different chemically. But then when you get to the fifth period, if something's in the same group in the next period, it's going to be. Um, have the same chemical properties generally to a, to a certain extent. Okay, um, let's see if we can figure this out. So, anybody know what a really good electrical conductor is? Give me an atom, a type of a type of atom that's a good or a type of element that's a Silver, good. Copper? Silver's good. Copper's good. Gold is good. Right. Take a look at this. Copper, silver, gold. Okay, they happen to be right there. They happen to have lots of free electrons and be right there. Platinum is right next to there, I think. I think that's platinum right next to it. Gold is AU right there. Okay, mercury is a very good conductor as well. Mercury is right in that area. These are metals. Okay, these, they're, by the way, they call some things like these are metals too. Hydrogen technically is kind of considered a, an alkaline metal. And the word alkali, I think they talked about this in your book has to do with the fact that uh, these, these metals over here, when you mix them together, they come from ash. Actually, if you burn stuff, you can end up getting some of these metals out of them. And when you mix that ash with water, it actually makes a nice kind of soapy thing. And so you can actually wash off other stuff. So this, these, they found that out. And so a lot of your soaps are made with these elements over here. Kind of cool. Okay. What's that? Well, maybe not so much lye. The really strong ones are. Yeah, if you look at um, like really strong industrial cleaners, they're made of lye, lithium, right? Which is, is lithium part of lye made from lithium? I think so. Or maybe it's potassium. I forget. I forget. Hmm. Well, anyway, so we've got the groups and then the periods. Now, this part we'll talk about in a little bit, but it's actually spread out. What this is, is these ones don't really feel, they don't fit in any groups up here. So they fit right in here. And it's as if you just took this piece and moved it over and chuck, chuck those two rows right in there so the table would be really, really long. And they do it this way so that you can fit it on a piece of paper. Otherwise, I'd have to have this really long and make it small, and it wouldn't, wouldn't fit very well. So that's why they put, break these ones out separately. OK? All right. And also, some of the cool ones are down here, too, like, oh, I don't know, uranium, plutonium, ber berkelium. Right? Those kind of neat ones. Uh, thorium's down there. Cesium down there. So, yeah. So, thorium, I think, is what it's called. Like Thor, yeah. Named for the god Thor. Yeah. Okay, so that's the periodic table in general. Now, if you look at the size of the atoms, actually, okay, if you look at the size of the atoms, including the electrons, okay, as you go, from right to left. Can you see a pattern here? Smaller. Gets smaller, except for a couple weird ones here, okay, which have to do with the way the atoms actually together. But for the most part, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay? Part of that is because of the it's because of the structure of the atom itself and the way things can kind of fit together. If you have um, something that's only got two protons and two electrons, they're not going to pull tight enough on all, tight, as tight to each other. And so it's going to be a little bit bigger. Okay? If you've got something that's way up here, then it's got lots of protons and lots of electrons. They tend to pull, pull together a little bit tighter. Okay? So that's kind of the, the idea when you, as you go farther, you go up in groups, you end up with a smaller atom. Okay? But they have more mass. But they do have more mass. Certain, yeah, and for the most case, they have more mass because they have more protons and neutrons. Yeah, you have more mass. 
I kind of briefly talked about this. We've got the alkali metals over here. We've got the alkaline earth metals. Those ones tend to be um, not actually able to be burned. So uh, the ancients thought those were kind of, they called those earth. And they thought, OK, we'll call those alkaline earth metals that can't really be burned. Although if you look at some of them, there's like magnesium in there and stuff. Magnesium can be burned. So I don't know, maybe it was when they're mixed with other ones. You've got these transition metals in here, which go from like uh, not very good conductors to better conductors. And all these are considered metals, the ones in the middle. Uh, but some are better like conductors than others, or they have different, obviously different properties. Some in here don't really have generic names. okay? But the kind of cool ones in here, silicon, which is a semiconductor, right? Uh, gallium is another semiconductor. We've got arsenic in here, okay, which is a very poisonous uh, atom or poisonous element. You've got, uh, let's see, what is this? Um, uh, tin, SN is in there. Lead is in there. I think that's bismuth. A lot of different cool ones in there. Okay, and then the carbon, boron, nitrogen, oxygen, all those are in there as well. These ones are called chalogens. I don't really know what that stands for, but these ones, these oxygen, sulfur, what are some of the other ones in there? Can't tell. Selenium, I think, is in there. Yeah, they do that. Okay. Then you've got the halogens. You know halogen light bulbs? Okay. Halogen light bulbs, um, actually, there's an element tungsten, which is what the filament of your light bulb is made of. Okay. Halogens actually, if you have a light bulb and it's got air in it, the tungsten, as it burns, will actually flake off some of the tungsten. And eventually, there'll be no more tungsten, and it'll break. Right? So then your light bulb doesn't last very long. Okay, what they try to do for regular light bulbs is just extract the air and make it as much of a vacuum as they can. But what a neater idea is to make these halogen bulbs. And instead of having oxygen or vacuum, you put halogen gas in there. And this is really cool. The tungsten reacts with the halogen gas. And then it actually, uh, as, it gets, as it gets hotter, it actually like, comes, it, how's it not, the word is not unreact. It reacts again with the tungsten on the filament and deposits itself back on the filament. So it's kind of cool. So the filament like recreates itself because the, of the halogen there. Halogens are like chlorines and bromines and all that kind of stuff. Okay? They put this in. I mean, the, Nobel, the noble gases are the ones like helium and argon and all that. Okay? Okay. So we've already seen this picture. Uh, these are the inner transition metals, they're called. The lanthanides and the actinides, right next to lanthium and actinum. Actinum? Actium? I forget which one that is. But anyway, those are, the, uh, those are the ones that are kind of fit in the middle. We put them down there again so we can fit it on a piece of paper. OK? All right. Yeah, question. What are batteries, made uh, batteries made out of a lot of different things. There are lead batteries, lead acid batteries. There are nickel, uh, nickel-based batteries. There are. Um, there are alkaline batteries, which have some of these ones. Yep, alkaline. Yeah, they're made from. Uh, they're made from things like there are lithium batteries. These ones tend to explode, right? Especially when you bring them on planes and things. There was a while for a while there they weren't going to let laptops on planes at all because of lithium batteries. But you can't ship batteries very easily. Yeah, lithium ones anyway. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's lots of cool. So you could. It, it, these days, most of the atoms have been, most of the elements have been figured out as far as what they're good for. But there's still, if you want to become a chemist, you've probably got a whole career if you pick one or two of these guys and try to come up with new chemicals from. Yeah, kind of. So, like, in the pharmaceutical field, they mm -hmm. try to like test medicine with like chemicals. And, like, Absolutely, in the in the pharmaceutical field, they take various atoms and they mix them together and try to come up with new chemicals and see how they behave. You know, and, and see if they are good for healing you or, you know, killing stuff. And, you know, it's uh, definitely there's a lot in this table because there's a lot of, because there's over 100 different elements. So lots of stuff you can do with the elements, okay? All right. So that's the, basically the periodic table. I kind of mentioned this before. The size of atoms are so tiny that if the entire world, was, or sorry, I guess if a baseball was the size of the entire world, the atoms in the baseball would be about the size of ping pong balls. Okay, does that, does that, make, that kind of make sense in the, in the scale size of things? 
a baseball, you look at a baseball, and then you think the entire world and a ping pong ball, that's how big the atoms are compared to the size of the baseball. Okay? Lots and lots and lots and lots of atoms in a baseball, and they're very, very, very small. And as I said before, you can't see them with light. We can see bacteria with a, with a good enough microscope because bacteria happen to be bigger than the wavelength of the light we're going to shine on them. Notice, but well, you can't even see them in here, if an atom is a tiny, tiny little bit here, right? You, let me see if I can zoom in a little on this. There we go. Uh, let's see. There we go. If I zoom in here, you can kind of see. If that's an atom, notice how tiny it is compared to the wavelength of the light we're trying to shine on it. No light will actually bounce off that atom. You won't be able to see it. Okay, we have to use other methods to see these. Okay? 10 to the negative 10th meters. We actually call that an angstrom. That's how big we're talking here. And that size, atoms are much smaller than an angstrom. And an angstrom is about as small or about as short a wavelength as you're going to get for light. So not going to see atoms with light. We've got to use other methods to figure out if they're there. Okay. How do we figure out what kinds of atoms are in things? This is kind of cool. We use these things called a spectroscope. Okay? And if you've ever looked through a prism, you've kind of seen what a spectroscope is. A spectroscope basically takes the light and spreads out the different frequencies that are coming from that light. And as it turns out, if you have an element and you uh, heat it way up, it emits frequencies based on the type of element it is which is kind of cool, OK? You analyze that light, and you can figure out what, atom, what element it is. Pretty cool. Each element has a distinctive glow with using this spectroscope, OK? It's kind of like the fingerprint of an atom, OK? The atomic spectrum. So we do use light to figure out what kinds of atoms, but it's all very um, secondhand, if you will. You have to figure out what light's coming from, then you analyze the patterns. Okay. There's actually, let's see, an interactive spectrum demo, which I am not sure I actually downloaded. I don't think I did. So we're going to have to skip that one. But the, uh, suffice it to say that we do this. Now, one cool thing about this, well, here's, here's what it looks like, first of all. This is tough to see on the screen here. But note, can you see the different colors of these lights? One's kind of reddish. One's kind of purple. The other's blue. The other's green. Those are flames. What this is is they take a little poker of some sort, put some element on it, like copper, put it in a flame, and you get a nice cool green flame. If you look at that in a spectroscope, this is what it looks like. And I'm going to zoom in on this one too. Copper, which is what that is, looks kind of like this in a, spe whoops, in a spectroscope. Okay? What you've got is you've got these bright lines, which are show the bright part of the spectrum. If you see that pattern coming from some light source, you know that it's probably got copper in it. Pretty cool. Okay, so you can say, ah, there's the fingerprint for copper. Okay, we've got other ones in here too. Barium looks like that. Notice you've got this kind of really bright one and then some other kind of less bright ones. Okay, you've got potassium in here. Okay, lots of blues down here. A little bit of green, big yellow one right there. And let's look at potassium over here. It's got a nice purple color to the potassium. Okay. Then you've got another one, strontium, which is kind of pinkish. And look, it's got nice, a couple of big red ones up here, maybe some blues and some other greens. But those are the fingerprints. And so scientists over the years have been able to categorize elements by their fingerprint. Cool. So it's kind of like a DNA strand. It's, exactly, it's kind of like a DNA. Yeah, like a fingerprint or a DNA, where you can tell what you element it is. One piece is out and something else. Yeah, okay. exactly. If, you, if you're missing a piece, probably something else. Now, you could have two different elements and they could kind of mix and match. Like you might get extras. But yeah. that's uh, well, like you, know, you have said, to do. like with the copper, it, it could be combined with another metal. Yeah. So. It could be combined with another one, yeah. Yeah. Okay. A yeah, a couple questions. With the flame, does that have to be a certain element burning? Uh, it is. It's burning, yeah. I mean, can yep. it be any Um, yeah, I mean, if it was kerosene, you'd probably see different, color different. different. You'd see the color for for uh, carbon, which is what carbon is. You know, kerosene is made out of carbon molecules. So here yeah. they're taking the flame that's coming out of a Bunsen burner or whatever mm -hmm. it is, and they're putting the element into the 
you have to putting like a carbon, like a copper salt in there into the flame. So what is yeah. what is the flame? What is burning there? They, uh, I think it's actually the actual molecules themselves are. They're either burning or they're getting hot enough to emit flame. I mean, to emit light from the flame. Yeah. So they do it in a, they, they, when they do it like this, it is kind of a salt. So it definitely, parts of it are, they're getting, it's getting hot enough so that the element itself is glowing that color. Okay. So yeah. It might not be burning per se, because you can't really, you can't really burn an individual atom of something, because that doesn't make sense. Burning involves oxygen and all this other, you know, it involves that. But you definitely get it hot enough so that it glows the, its color. So is that a Yeah, I think it is. I think it is a control to, to get her to, to burn. Yeah. You had a question, James? Uh, uh, have you ever threw citronella in a fire? I've never thrown citronella in a fire. Uh, what does it do? Like if you pour it in like a can, uh -huh. it shoots out like red and green and blue flames. Oh, no kidding. Different colored flames. All right. There you go. I don't know if that's the best thing for your lungs, but you never know. Neither is this, by the way. Some of these are probably not, not so good to sit there. You do this under a, a hood or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, another question. When you're looking through a spectroscope, does it have to be something on fire, or can I look at a reflection of white light off of gold into a spectroscope? No, you can, that's a good question. Can you look at like the reflection of light off of gold and see it? No, it's got to be something. It's got to be heated up to a certain temperature, uh, et cetera. I'm, I'm fairly certain about that. There's probably other ways you can do it, but that's the, the big one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Tom. Now, can't you shine light through like a gas? You, uh, can you shine light through a gas? Yes, you don't necessarily get it to uh, you know, shine like this. It's really, remember, this is, um, you have to get, you have to have the element itself radiating. Okay, so uh, neon lights, right? You've got neon in there and that, they glow pink or whatever based on the fact that neon glows that pink color. Mercury lights are the same way. If you had a spectroscope here, you could see the spectral lines for mercury. Yeah. Right. Kind of like a kaleidoscope. It looks like a kaleidoscope. Yeah, I wish I had one, but um, when you look through it, you get to see these kind of this pattern like that. They're pretty simple things, basically uh, little prisms. Okay. So I, I know I've got a slide on it here, but one element that you know of was actually discovered with a spectroscope, and was not discovered on Earth at all until much later. Okay, it was discovered with a spectroscope. We'll get to that in a minute. I'm going to give you a little, you, of course, you all read the chapters, right? So you know what the answer is. Cheese. <laughs> Not cheese. Okay, here's what happens with the spectroscope. So this is why you have to, you have to actually get it hot enough so that it, um, so that it uh, releases light. When you when you uh, excite an element, whether it's by heating it up or some other method, electrically or something like that, you can actually give the electron some potential energy. Okay? And it actually gains potential energy and jumps up to a different level. Now, it's all, when I say it jumps to a different level, it's all based on these quantum mechanics things. And don't worry about that, but you can think of it like this. You can say that it moves farther and actually does move farther away from the nucleus because it's got more energy. Moves farther away, okay? Once it ha is that at that farther distance, it's pretty unstable. When it jumps back down, that's when it releases this light. And it's that light that you can actually see those different uh, frequencies in, okay? When the electron jumps back down and loses that potential energy, it moves closer to the nucleus, it gives off a beam of light, and that light is what we're looking at in the spectroscope. And we say, aha, that's the fingerprint for whatever it happens to be. Okay? In this case, one, two, three, four, whatever four is. Um, helium, lithium, whatever the next one is. Beryllium? Got it, beryllium. Okay. All right. So you can also jump more than one level. And we'll get to what all this means a little bit later, actually, probably next week. But you can jump. At each level, it releases a different frequency of light. So if it jumps up two levels, it might jump back down. Let's say it jumps up. Yeah, it might jump back down one level and release a little red, be a red uh, ray of light. If it jumps down to the next one, it would be green. If it jumps from the third one all the way down to the first one, 
it might release a blue one. And that's why you get different lines, because these, these uh, electrons are jumping back down to various levels of distance from the, elect from the nucleus. Okay? That's how you get these different frequencies of light. Okay? All right. All right, so here's your check question. The hydrogen spectrum consists of many spectral lines. Those are those little lines we talked about. How can this simple element have so many lines? Is one electron boosted to many different energy levels? Can the electron move at a variety of speeds? We didn't really get into this, so the electron can vibrate at lots of frequencies, or there's many standing waves can fit inside of the electron. Did I say anything about waves yet? No. Not really, so probably not that one. We did talk about vibration, but it turns out that a, a, an atom only really wants to vibrate at one frequency if it can help. So probably not that one. Can it go lots of speeds? It can go lots of speeds, but it, it's generally limited. Can it be boosted to different levels? Yeah, that's the one we talked about. Okay, All right, different levels. OK, I tell you what, let's do this. Let's take the break now so you can get back before colors. And we'll see you back in 10 minutes. All right, so who wants to remember or who wants to know what the element that was discovered is? Helium. Hel hey, there you go. Helium. All right, so if you aim a spectroscope at a star, OK, you'll be able to see what the, what the components of light coming from the star are. OK, you can look at the spectral patterns. Now, remember I said that stars are generally uh, very white light. Some are actually slightly different colors. Our star happens to be a pretty white star. Okay? But as it turns out, um, in the 1800s, we pointed a spectroscope at the, star, at the sun, took a look at it, and they looked at the patterns of the spectral lines coming from the sun, and they said, wait a minute, we haven't seen this one before. <laughs> what is this? And so they realized there must be some other element on the sun that hadn't yet been discovered on Earth. And it turned out it was helium. And helium is actually named after the Greek god for sun, Helios. So there you go. Helium was first discovered on the sun. Helium today is actually, um, we're running out of helium, believe it or not. That, the balloon, when you fill up a balloon with helium, you know, it costs you like you know, $2 or something to fill it up, right? It should cost like $400 because the, the worth helium should be worth a lot more um, because it's not easy to find. It turns out helium on Earth is only created from fission of like uranium and other heavy metals like that, radioactive metals, and it seeps out. And then if it gets into the atmosphere, it's gone, right? But what it does is it actually seeps out, ends up mixing with natural gas generally in pockets under the Earth. And when they get natural gas, one of the things they also find is helium. They capture it and then they sell it. Yeah? That's exactly what I was going to That's what you were going to say? Yeah. Was how they well, one of my best friends uh -huh. And he went in to get a tank of helium, or a new tank of helium. And they said, oh, yeah, we don't have any. It's, it's, it's so expensive now, yeah. And uh, they, they said, well, do you have any left at the, at the school? And they offered to buy it back from them. Really? They offered yeah. to buy it back? Wow. wow. When, I, when I was in college, I had a, uh, a project. And, and it was a project that, that was based on these little microchips we were creating. But it was kind of cool. But we had to use the microchip in something. And one of my lab partners, a good friend of mine, decided he wanted to do something cool. Like people were using like, I don't know, remote control cars or this and that, little stuff, table based. He's like, let's get a blimp. So we went online, we, well it wasn't online, I guess we had to call up a catalog or something back then, but it was, uh, I know that's how old I am. Um, there was no internet when I was in college, believe it or not. I mean there wasn't any World Wide Web, there was the internet, but no World Wide Web. Uh, barely any of my friends from high school had email addresses in college. Like the two that did, I was like, wow, you have email. It was kind of cool. But Anyway, um, we got this blimp that was about as long as this table and about this wide. And we had to fill it with helium. And we, we didn't have any helium. So we went to various chemistry labs and said, hey, do you have any helium? Can we use some? <laughs> this one poor professor, he says, uh, yeah, you, you can have some of my helium, sure. And we like go to his tank, and he sees this blimp. And we like, shh, you know, I mean, the thing, it took you know probably half his helium. He's, <laughs> after we filled it, because you know, that helium is like, 99.99999% pure helium. This is not the stuff that you buy to like fill yeah. up your balloons with. <laughs> this stuff costs a lot of money. <laughs> We're like, oops, sorry. And you can get it on the door, so you have to yeah, we couldn't get it. You're right. No, but we, we did end up getting it also. 
It was kind of cool. And the project worked okay. It wasn't great, but it was cool. It was kind of fun. And we, and we made the newspaper on school, you know, because somebody took a picture and whatever. Nice. Question. Nice. Oh, nice. Yeah, there you go. So you guys have, I've mentioned this a couple times, um, quantum mechanics or quantum theory. Remember before we were talking about how the, the, the electrons would jump to various levels? Well, it turns out they don't jump between any levels. They always jump from one level to the next to the next, and there's no jumping in between. And in fact, they actually don't ever really end up between those levels at all. They're either in one or they're in the other, and they're never. They don't take time to jump to that next level. They're either in one or in the other, and that's it. Okay, it's very bizarre. But this guy named Ma Max Planck, German uh, guy, said that, hey, if you look at uh, radiation coming from bodies, like uh, light radiation, he hypothesized that this radiation only comes in these little discrete bundles, discrete meaning those at those levels. Okay? And he said those are called quanta, and the energy of those levels is completely, per completely proportional to the frequency of that light. Einstein, believe it or not, Einstein's involved here. He came around and said light itself is this quantum amount. Okay? He said a beam of light is not a continuous wave of energy. He said the energy actually is these little tiny bundles, which we call photons. Okay? Now, in the end, what people realized were that Einstein was right that we have photons of light depending on how you look at it. Sometimes you can consider light to be a photon in these little bundles. Sometimes you can consider light to be a wave like what we talked about the other day. It's kind of, light is weird in that it can be both one or the other depending on how you look at it. Okay? So that in itself is a little bit odd. And we're not going to go into much more detail about this, but just know that when you think about light, you can think about it as these little tiny bundles of energy. Okay? And this is kind of what I was just talking about. Light is both a stream of particles and a wave. Okay? And what does that mean, really? Well, it just means that depending on how you look at it, that's what you get. Okay? You can either describe it like a wave or a particle, depending on what experiment you're doing on it. Pretty cool stuff. Later, we'll get into some more interesting uh, things about that. But what we know is definitely that the energy of these little bundles is directly proportional. In other words, if the energy goes up, the frequency has to go up. The frequency goes down, the energy goes down. It's just like all those other um, types of situations where we have direct relationships. Okay? All right. So that's the quantum hypothesis. Okay, ready? Uh-oh, I must be missing my must be missing my image. Which has the greatest energy per photon? Do you remember what light had the highest frequency? Blue light, Blue light right? Well, guess what? Blue light has the greatest energy because it's the highest frequency. Okay? Blue light. Because we have this relationship, energy is proportional to frequency, in other words, directly proportional. The highest frequency of light is the greatest energy. So blue light has more energy than red light. Okay? X-rays, which are really high frequency, have much more energy. Part of the reason they can penetrate through your skin, but they get stopped by bones. And also part of the reason they're not very good in high quantities. Because they, they're so high energy, X-rays, that they will, actually, uh, they will actually ionize, in other words, when they hit your skin, they will sometimes cause electrons to come off, making the particles unstable. And that's what tends to mutate them and that sort of thing. So not so great if you get lots and lots of x-rays hitting you. Which has the smallest energy? Choices are infrared, visible, or ultraviolet? Visible. Remember which ones were, remember we went, let's, let's go over this again, because I might ask you something like this. What was way at the bottom of the spectrum? Remember which kind of rays way at the bottom? Visible. Not visible. The ones that we use to communicate with submarines? Radio. radio waves. And we use the ones to communicate on radios with, right? Radio waves. 
then it went up to microwaves, then it went up to infrared, then it went up to visible, then it went up to ultraviolet, then it went up to x-rays, and then finally gamma rays. Okay? I'm not going to ask you those orders, but which one has the, lowest, the, the longest wavelength or the lowest frequency? Infrared. So that's got the smallest amount of energy. And remember, you're all emitting infrared radiation right now, and it's not hurting anybody. Very low energy. Okay? Lowest. All right. Okay. This guy named Niels Bohr came along. He was a Nobel Prize winner. Interesting. So the Nobel medal, the medal they give you is made out of pure gold. Pretty cool. They also give you lots of money, too. But they, made, they give you a medal, and it's about this big, and it's made out of pure gold. Niels Bohr... This is actually an interesting, he, he won his medal before World War II. During World War II, he didn't want the Nazis to come along and steal his medal. Right? They was, he, he actually lived in, I think, Denmark. And uh, Denmark was at war like a lot of other you know, countries at that time. And he didn't want, uh, I, he didn't want the Nazis to come by and, and steal his uh, Nobel, Pri Nobel medal. So he actually dissolved it, his medal, in a, an acid, and he put it on his shelf, right? Yes. And throughout the whole war, nobody touched his shelf of chemicals and blah, blah, blah. At the end of the war, he did another chemical uh, experiment with it, and he leached out the gold, yeah. sent it back to the Nobel Committee, and they reformed it into his metal. No way. Isn't that cool? Yeah, pretty cool. Anyway, Niels Bohr won the Nobel Prize because he talked about why atoms don't actually collapse. Now let's think about an atom for a second. It's got, let me, let me write this nice and big. I'll do it on this one right here. Here's an atom, okay? It's got a couple of, let's say it's got two protons and a couple of neutrons in there, okay? And then some electrons over here and electron over there, okay? From what we did in the lab last night, that third lab, but what do you know about negatives and positives. They attract each other, right? Okay? So first of all, if these electrons were actually spinning around here, okay, if they were actually like spinning around, we know they're moving and we know they're accelerating. If they were accelerating, first of all, we said that accelerating electrons in electricity, when we talk about electricity, accelerating electrons actually radiate energy. Okay? They create electromagnetic waves and they create magnetic waves and whatever, okay? If that was the case, they would lose energy and they should spin right in to the middle. We know that negatives and positives, what did we say? Attract, Attract each other. So what's stopping the electron from just kind of going whoop into the middle there? The other negative, I guess so, but there are two positives here. So why don't the two negatives just kind of go boop and, and right in there? The neutrons are neutral. They don't care electrically. Well, that's a very good question, and it took scientists a long time to figure that out. Bohr came along and he said, aha, electrons only can only lose specific amounts of energy. Okay? The electron can't be over here because of this idea that it only loses certain amounts of energy. Okay? And as it turns out, it's only between those levels we talked about. Okay? And there is a level at which the electron can't lose any more energy. It's just not going to. That level happens to be a certain distance from these protons in an atom. Okay? Bohr came up with this idea and he said, hey, what if these energy levels are quantized, just like we talked about before, certain levels and the electrons can only be at those levels, and there's a minimum. And if that's the case, that might explain why electrons don't fly into the nucleus, and then there's no more atoms. Turns out he was pretty much right. He came up with this planetary model, okay? which you've all seen a model of an atom with the electrons kind of flying around the outside. It's a terrible model from a real perspective. Like it's not, in the book they go into this, they go into a lot of discussion about conceptual models versus actual, uh, what do they call them? Not physical models. 
This is definitely a conceptual model. In other words, this is not really what's going on. There are no like, electrons orbiting around. But we can think about them being in these shells around the nucleus that are the energy levels. We can think of them that way. They're not really like that. Okay? But these photons get emitted. We already talked about that, when, energy, when electrons drop below to another level. Okay? And the energy of these photons is the difference in energy between the two levels. Okay? And that's why we get these discrete, in other words, these specific frequencies, because the electron jumps below, jumps to another level. But Bohr's big idea was there are these levels that are fixed, and the electron's not going to get below them and not going to end up running into the protons. Okay? Here's what the shell model really looks like. You've got the nucleus in the middle, and then as you go out, you've got where certain electrons are. So you can kind of see here, at the middle, you've got uh, two electrons in that first shell, eight electrons in the next shell, eight electrons in the next shell, et cetera, et cetera. And we're going to talk a little bit about that when we talk about how chemicals react with each other, because it's all about, or how atoms become molecules. It's all about these shells and how many electrons are allowed in each shell. If you've got two electrons in the first shell there, that's it. You're not going to get any more. Guess how many electrons there are in a helium? Two. Helium has two protons, two neutrons, and two electrons. And that first little shell is completely filled. And what did we know about helium? What kind of gas did we say it was? It has to do with kings and queens. It's a noble gas because it hates to react with other things. It just doesn't react. One of the reasons it doesn't react is because that first little level, already filled, no more need to worry about other electrons. Okay? If you go to 3, which is, what is that, lithium, right? Lithium has another proton, maybe another neutron, and another electron. The next little level needs 8 to be filled. Or you could get rid of one of those electrons and be down to 2 and be perfectly happy. Ooh. Turns out that lithium reacts very, very, very well with other atoms that want to grab an extra electron. Okay? So it turns out that it works out perfectly that way. We'll get into all those details in the next couple chapters, but that's just kind of a, a little kind of preview, that sort of stuff. Okay? Shell model. Here we go. This is kind of what we had here. Hydrogen, one little electron, relatively, uh, uh, it likes to mix with other atoms, particularly oxygen. Makes water, right? Helium, two. You've got lithium, which has two, and then one extra. Makes it very reactive. Da -da 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 -da. Neon has two and then eight. Oh, eight was the second level. It's filled. Doesn't react. Look at fluorine. Two there, and then seven in the outer. How many did we say need to be filled? Eight. Eight. If it's got just one more, it would be perfect. What's it going to connect with? Lithium, which needs to give up one. Lithium and fluorine make a very strong metal. Let's look at what a couple others that we might. Let's see if we have. Aha, this one's sodium. Sodium, two and then eight and then one. That third level also needs eight. So that one is just hanging out there. I'd rather just get rid of it. Let's look at um, chlorine. It's got two and then eight and then seven. So do you think sodium and chlorine are going to want to mix together? Want to combine together? Absolutely. What do we call sodium chloride? Bleach. Not bleach? No. Salt. Yeah. salt. Sodium chloride is salt. Okay. And by the way, you have to heat it up to like 1,300 degrees Celsius before you can melt it to break those apart. In water, it happens to break apart instantly, but different story. You had a question, Tom? Uh, are you going to cover rust? Uh, are we going to cover rust? Yes. Not now, though. No. Not now. We will cover that eventually. All right. So the shell model shows the first three periods of this table. Again, not really, really exactly what's going on, but enough so that we can figure out a little bit more about this whole chemistry thing. OK. So that was the first chemistry chapter. That wasn't too bad, right? Who, who in here said they hated chemistry? A couple people were like, I hate chemistry. I yeah, I didn't do very well in chemistry when I was in, in high school or college. Um, I mean, I did all right, but not, not great. 
when you, when you go back and you think, OK, fine, chemistry is just applied physics, it seems to make things a lot easier. <laughs> okay? And uh, by the way, we're not going to do that much math with this either. If you hated chemistry because it was all about math and this and that, we're going to do some. We do some chemical reactions and things. Not much. So don't worry about that. OK. Again, this next chapter, this is chapter now 13, the atomic nucleus and radioactivity. I consider this pure physics. Chemist, chemists might disagree with me, but I consider this stuff pure physics because it really does talk about what happens at the nuclear level. You guys know that's where nuclear comes from, right? The nucleus, right? Nuclear comes from nucleus, not nuclear, as some former presidents used to say. Nuclear. OK. So we're going to talk about radioactivity. Anybody know where that fish came from? Simpsons. Simpsons. That was in one of the first, I think it was the first season. Yep. They talked about the atomic fall, like atomic uh, water, or the, nu the radiated water that was water. Mr. Burns was pumping into the river. Lake Springfield. Lake Springfield, was that it? Yeah. Is it what? Could that happen? Could that, well, mutations can certainly happen. I don't know that we get three eyed fishes, but maybe. We say that elements that are unstable, their nucleus is unstable. We call the radioactive. Okay, what it means is the nucleus is in some form that those protons and neutrons, something's upsetting about them. They're not stable and they want to change. Okay? When they break down, when these nuclei break down, they actually eject other particles. Sometimes they eject uh, radiation. We call those gamma rays. It actually, I mean, they are the gamma rays we've been talking about this whole time. Sometimes they actually uh, eject actual particles, like electrons and helium nuclei, which we'll talk about. Okay? This is called radioactive decay. Radio radioactive decay is not something that's been around just since 1945 when we, when we blew up the first nuclear bombs. Okay? We had, well, we had, even so, before that, radioactivity has been around since the beginning of the Earth. Okay? Uranium, which is in the Earth's crust, is radioactive. Radon, which I talked about, in the Earth's crust, radioactive. Okay? Radiation is not a new thing. We didn't know about it until the early part of the 20th century, but it's not a new thing. Okay? So don't think that it's somehow like artificial. It's de definitely a natural process. Okay? When we talk about radiation, we don't talk about A, B, and C radiation. <laughs> we talk about alpha, beta, and gamma rays. Okay? The reason we call these high, high frequency rays gamma rays is because they're actually caused by this radiation. The alpha rays and the beta rays are not rays in the traditional electromagnetic sense. Okay? But we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. But by the way, in Greek, the first three letters, alpha, alpha beta, gamma, correct? ABC. ABC. Right? Except really G for us. <laughs> there you go. If you have an element that has an atomic number greater than 83, which is bismuth, it's going to be radioactive. It's just too bad. It's going to be radioactive. Part of the reason that's the case is that those atoms are so big that they don't stick together well. And we'll talk about why that's the case in a little bit. Okay? The elements release three different types of radiation. Only one of them is electromagnetic, gamma rays. And here's what happens. Can you see this little um, diagram here I have? Yeah. Alpha rays are rather big. They're actually helium nucleus, nuclei. And they are not very energetic. They're big. They're relatively slow. They will be stopped by a piece of paper or your skin, generally. Okay. If, there, if you have enough alpha radiation, you don't, it's not going to be good for you. But in general, alpha radiation can stop by a piece of paper. Beta radiation, beta particles are actually just electrons. All they are. There's free electrons flying through, the, flying through space. Beta particles will go through a piece of paper, but be stopped by like a piece of wood. Okay? Gamma radiation, on the other hand, will go through paper, will go through wood, and might be stopped by concrete or lead or something like that. They will all eventually be stopped by enough lead. But you can get really high radiation gamma rays that will go pretty far into lead even. Bad, bad news. You don't want to get hit by too many gamma rays. 
You do every day outside, but not enough to you know, cause too much harm generally. Right? But gamma rays, bad, bad news in that sense. Those are the most energetic right there. Those are the three we've got to talk about. Okay? Alpha particles, as I said, they are a helium nucleus. Helium, we said, has two protons, two neutrons, two electrons. Strip away the electrons, you've got an alpha particle. Okay? It's got two protons, two neutrons, and that's it. That's called an alpha particle, and it's just a helium nucleus. If it's got two protons and no electrons, what kind of charge does it have? Positive, Positive charge. Therefore, if it's a charged particle moving through a magnetic field, it will feel a force. Remember we talked about that from electricity? Yeah, this is just physics, right? So if you take a piece of radium, which has all three types of radiation, and you, sh and you put a little hole in it and you shoot the particles out that hole, you put a magnet there, the protons will go one way. Well, the, nu the helium nucleus, or the alpha particles, will go one way. The beta particles, we said, were just an electron. A single old electron, which is what charge? Negative. Negative. If you put it in a magnetic field, it'll go the other way. It gets a different charge. Because it's got a different charge, it gets a different force on it, the opposite direction. Gamma rays are just electromagnetic rays. No charges associated with that. They do not feel any force in a magnetic field. They will go straight. So if you happen to have a way to figure out what, these, what direction these particles go, you can figure out which ones they are. If they go straight, they're gamma rays. If they go this direction, they're helium nuclear or, or uh, alpha particles. If they go the other way, beta particles. Kind of cool. Okay, That's how the three different types of radiation. OK, a little more detail on some of these. Alpha particles. What kind of nuclei did I say? Helium, Helium nuclei. They are positive. OK, two photons or two protons, two neutrons, which is a helium nucleus. They lose energy quickly. They're big, they're heavy, they're not really moving that fast. They lose energy quickly. Paper will stop them. Your skin will stop them. Okay. If you're wearing clothing and there's alpha radiation, you're probably OK. okay? Don't sit there forever, but you're probably OK. Not going to get through your clothes. If they are moving fast enough, they can damage your skin. right? They probably won't penetrate through it, but they can damage the outside of your skin. Not so great. Once they end up with the electrons, they're just simply helium. And that's how, the helium, that's how helium actually is created. Uranium decays. It gets, part of the decay is a helium nucleus. Electrons end up on that, with that helium nucleus, and it's just helium. That's how you end up with it. And you can deflect it in a magnetic or electric field. Pretty cool. Okay. Beta particles, we said were what? Elect electrons, just electrons, that's all they are. A neutron will eject electrons, which is like mind blowing. Right? A neutron actually, in some sense, you can think of a neutron as having an electron built into it. Whoa, that's cool. Weird, but cool. And when, it, when, when a neutron ejects an electron, it becomes positive charge. And you know what it turns into? What'd you say? Somebody said it. A proton. Ho oh, ho. A neutron gets rid of an electron, becomes a proton. Mind blowing. Very cool. Beta particles, we get those from neutrons becoming protons. Smaller mass, obviously smaller mass, just an electron, tiny little charge, tiny little mass, same electric charge. Does move faster though. Loses energy slower because it's faster. Okay? can be stopped by like aluminum foil. A few sheets of aluminum foil, no electrons are going to go through it. Good. Will go into your skin, though. Not so good. <laughs> so if there's beta radiation, you might want to get out of the way. Okay. Werewolf. Once stopped, it's just an electron. What's that? Werewood suit. Werewood suit. You know, your television, old school televisions, shot beams of electrons straight at you. Most of them got stopped by the phosphorus layer there. That's why they showed up on the screen. But some of them got through. If you took your TV apart and were playing around with a little thing in there, you're going to get electrons. You know, not good. Not so good. Not really going fast, that fast, but still. 
they go the other way in a magnetic field because they're negatively charged. Okay? And finally, gamma rays. Gamma rays are actual rays of light, high energy light. We've talked about them already, high frequency radiation emitted when a nucleus gets ex excited and then just drops to a different level. The nucleus itself can get excited. Okay? Much more harmful than alpha or beta particles. No mass, no charge, go right through a lot of stuff. When they finally get stopped by your skin or your bones or whatever, damage, mutations, damage, cell damage, not good. Pure energy, even more energy than x-rays, bad, bad news. And they do not get deflected in a field. Uh, are there suits? Uh, lead suits, maybe. <laughs> That's about it, though. Yeah, you gotta have something really like thick lead. How many, do it. How many X-rays? Well, X-rays aren't so big of a deal, to tell you the truth. I mean, if you get lots and lots of X-rays, not good. But ever have a uh, CAT scan? That's a huge amount of X-rays. You know, because they do X-ray, 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 X-ray all around your head or body or whatever. MRI, no X-rays, just magnets. Pretty cool. But if you forget to take your watch off, it'll like go shtoink and like might hurt you. Well, depending on where your watch is. True. But if most of them are made out of metal to some extent. Well, titanium okay. is not magnetic, is it? Titanium I don't think is magnetic in the same sense, no. Anybody have any questions about alpha, beta, or gamma rays? Which one's the only one that's not a particle or a set of particles? Gamma. 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 Which one's the one that can harm you the most? Gamma. 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 Which one's the one that comes from uranium? Uh, maybe to some extent, but what's the other one? The main main one, alpha particles. Okay, which one is when a neutron turns into a proton? Beta. Beta. Okay, you guys do have to. You should know those. And here we go, alpha, beta, part, gamma. Okay, I should be able to say alpha particle. You go helium nucleus, pretty big, stopped by skin, <laughs> right? Or you say beta particle. You go, oh, it's an electron. That's all it is, just an electron. Oh yeah, and it happens when a neutron turns into a proton, pops out an electron. Gamma ray, bad news, you know, really high frequency. Just light, but high frequency light. Stopped by lead. Should be able to say that, okay? Did I stop my foot enough on that? Should be able to say that. <clears throat> okay, there we go. All right. So we talked about a little bit about why the electrons don't fall into the neutron or the, the nucleus. It's because of these weird energy levels that quantum mechanics talks about, right? Why then? Why, why, why? If you took, remember in the, in the lab last night, if you took, like they had the little positive. If you put another positive right next to it, what would happen to that first positive? It would go, foom flying away from it. In a nucleus, protons are like right next to other protons. And there's a couple neutrons in there too. What's keeping those protons from going foop and flying apart? The neutrons do act a little bit like nucleus glue. A little bit. Like they do help out. But the protons themselves actually uh, would stick together even if you took the neutrons apart. Maybe not forever, but they would stick together. Okay? The electric force is huge here. But at this close distance, there is another force, like Star Wars. There is another. Okay? Are they bonded? They are, well, bonding's probably not the right word, but they are together by another force. You guys thought there was electricity, there was gravity, there was magnetism which really is just electricity in a different form, right? There is another force. It's called the strong nuclear force. It is a completely fundamental force, OK? The strong nuclear force acts on particles that are very close together, like neutrons and protons. When they get really close together, this force takes over and holds them together. So if you look at this little diagram, OK, let me blow this diagram up a little bit. If you look at this little diagram here, OK, when the two protons are right next to each other, the nuclear force is big. So is the electric force. But which one's bigger? Nuclear. The nuclear force. 
you bring those protons just a little bit farther apart from each other, look at the nuclear force. Five. Nothing. Look at the electric force. Still pretty huge. So if you were to take two protons and you go, you get them to like here, they go, fly apart from each other. Because all of a sudden, what was keeping them together is, is that. <coughs> this equation is one of the few ones which is not an inverse distance squared equation. Remember electric was distance squared on the bottom? And gravity was. And so was magnetism. Not the nuclear force. I don't remember what it is. It's like, it's like distance to the fourth or something like that. So once you get a little bit farther away, the, tr the force drops way off. Pretty cool stuff. But it's the only reason neutron or nucleus stay together. It's this strong nuclear force. There's also a weak nuclear force, which I think is more like electricity. I'm not sure on that. I'll have to look it up. But that's, that's another fundamental force. Okay? We might not have ever known existed until right now. Maybe you guys did. I don't know. Okay, but that's the other force. Okay? So here's a little bit more about this. Neutrons do help keep the nucleus together. Do neutrons have an electric force that pushes them apart? Neutron. Neutrons. They're, nu they're neutral, right? No electric force. They do have a nuclear force. So if you get a couple of these protons together, they are really going to want to fall apart. Okay? Why? Because that, they've got lots of electric force pushing them away. But if all of a sudden you add two more neutrons to the mix, you've got, two, you've got basically twice as much nuclear force. So that's why I said earlier that neutrons kind of are like nuclear glue. They help hold together the nucleus because at these close distances, you can get them really close together. Now, by the way, we'll get to this in a little bit. As you get more and more and more and more of these together, aren't you getting farther from the center? And so now two protons are now not right, not right next to each other with a really big nuclear force. They might be here and here. Well, that means the nuclear force is less. They're more likely to go, oh, I'm not sticking around, boom, and fall apart. So bigger atoms tend to be the radioactive ones. Remember how we said anything above bismuth, 83? radioactive, that's because they're big and their protons are so far apart from each other that they don't want to stick together anymore. Kind of cool stuff. Okay. All right. And this is exactly what I'm talking about. See how far apart these ones are from each other? They're going to have lots of electric force on them. Lots and lots of electric force. Okay. All right. Let's see. How about this? I think if we take a 10 minute break now, we'll probably still get out a little bit early. I know a couple of you guys are about to fall over. I can see it already. Let's take a break right now. 10 minutes, 12 minutes. We'll come back at 10 of, and then we'll probably get out a little early. OK, there we go. All right, so we just finished with the strong nuclear force. The next thing we're going to talk about is this idea of half-life. I'm not talking about the video game. I'm talking about a radioactive particle that, or, or a radioactive substance that decays over time due to, due to radiation. Okay? We, we call the, the amount of time that it takes to become half as many particles, it's half-life. We'll get into the details of that in a little bit. And we're also going to talk about transmutation. The alchemists that we talked about at the beginning of class, the ones who tried to turn lead into gold, were trying to transmute particles or atoms, elements, really. They were trying to turn one element into another element. As it turns out, there is a way to do that. Okay? In fact, I think, I think chemists have turned gold into, or lead into gold. The problem is it costs like $10,000 an ounce or something like that. I mean, it's, and it's radioactive. So it's kind of a you know, radioactive gold. OK, here's what the half-life is. Okay? It's the rate of decay of a radioactive isotope. Okay? Remember, isotope was just more neutrons or different types of neutrons in an atom. It's the time required for half of the material to be gone. 
Okay? If you just set a material down and it, and it, radi it had radiation and the particles changed into, and, and uh, decayed, over the half-life, half the material would be gone. It is independent of any chemistry involved. It just has to do with the atoms themselves. They randomly decay, but at the rate of the half-life. Okay? You can calculate the half-life by taking a substance and figuring out how often it decays. Okay? Let's try something. Let's say I have, let's say I have an, a, a chunk of material that's radioactive. And it's got a half-life of one day. Okay? After one day of sitting there, how much is left? Half. After two days, how much is left? Quarter. Quarter. After three days? An eighth. Four days? One sixteenth. It actually decays exponentially like that. Okay? If you think about it, it'll never completely go away because every day it's only one half again. Right? But that's the, that's the idea. So good job on that. Okay? Ah, here we go. After two days, one quarter. Some people think if it's half after one day, the second day it's also half, so it's gone. But no, no. It's just half of what's left after that one day. Okay, now, so it is one quarter. Yeah? Now, the Bush gives the example of radium. Mm -hmm. And it, after 20 half lives, the initial quantity of radium redimensioned by a factor of about 1 million. Yep. And that's when it loses its radioactivity. No, not really. I mean, let's, if you have a chunk of radium, okay. does it say the half-life? How long it is? I don't know if it says. Uh, 1,620 years. Okay, so after 1,620 years, that chunk, that container of radium, half the radium's gone. It's turned into something else. Okay? After another 1,600 years, the next half is gone. After 20 years, one, it's got about a millionth of the, what you started with left. So there's still some left. But it's a million, which is, oh, sorry, 20 half-lives? Yeah. So, OK, so 1,000 times 20,000 20, years, it's down to uh, one millionth of where it started. So that's the way you can figure it out. And you can always, you can do it by just, you square it, then you cube it, then you, or you square it, then you, want it, then you do it to the fourth, then you do it to the eighth, et cetera, et cetera. So you could do it that way. Uh, pro or other particles. We'll talk about the types of decay. We already talked about them, but we'll talk about specific examples in a little bit. Yep. Okay. So here's the exponential scale I was talking about. They decay at the rate based on their substance. Okay. Shorter the half-life, the faster it disintegrates. Some of those part, some of those elements way up at the top of the up the uh, periodic table decay in like a millionth of a second. They're there, then they're gone. Because they're just so big, they just decay. Okay? But some things like uranium, uranium has a half-life of, anybody remember from the reading, roughly? Four and a half billion years. So the, rate, the uranium that started when the Earth started, about half of it's gone now. Okay? It's going to be another four billion years before the rest of it, before the next half is gone, before it's a quarter. Well, if we mine it and then, uh, well, so, yeah, right. I mean, if we mine the uranium and then start what's called a chain reaction, which we'll get to, you can make the uranium decay faster, but that's because the, you're, you're causing it to decay faster. Okay? All right. Transmutation is when one element changes into another element. Mind-blowing stuff. It wasn't until like the 1930s that anybody had any idea that this happened. Right? Actually, I guess it was a little, a little earlier than that, 20s maybe. Nobody had any idea this happened until this guy Rutherford came along and figured out some of it. Okay? Here's an example. Okay? If you have nitrogen, which has seven protons, let's say you have nitrogen 14, which also has seven neutrons. If you shoot a neutron at nitrogen, okay, how you do that is a different story, but if you shoot it there, it might, might get absorbed okay, into the atom and then shoot out a proton. 
if it shot out that proton, or a, heli a hydrogen nu nucleus actually, it now has six protons. Before it had seven. And now it has eight neutrons. But it's the protons that determine what element it is. So it turns into carbon. So you shoot a neutron at a nitrogen atom. Sometimes it becomes a carbon and a hydrogen. This is not chemical. This is nuclear physics right now. Okay, This is nuclear physics. Is it always, okay. is it always a proton? Uh, In this reaction, it's always a proton, yeah. It just depends on the... It depends on the type of elements and what you're shooting at it and so forth. Okay, We do have natural transmutation. That's when we have uranium turning into other things naturally radiating. We also can artificially do this, like if we did this in the lab where we shot a neutron at a ni nitrogen. Okay? So is it hit and miss of whether it... Totally hit or miss. Yeah, you have, to, you have to aim it right there. It has to be going slow enough to get absorbed, et cetera, et cetera. But is it hit yep. and miss of whether it expels a proton versus a... No. In this one, it will always expel a proton in this case. Okay? We have alpha transmutation, where you get an alpha particle, which was what? Helium, helium nucleus. Helium nucleus. If you get rid of the, a helium, right, which has two protons okay, and two neutrons, you decrease the mass by those four amounts. Four, you get down by four on its mass. You decrease the number by two because two protons are gone. And the resulting atom is two places backwards on the periodic table. Does that make sense? You start with an atom, in this case uranium. Uranium 238, by the way. 238 is, is not the stuff that we use to make nuclear bombs. This is a natural reaction here. We do not use the 238, we use 235 to make nuclear bombs. 238. Degree, it, it, it uh, emits an alpha particle, alpha radiation, and it becomes thorium, which is two back on the periodic table. If you look at the periodic table, you go, oh, 92 is uranium, 90 is thorium. Okay? And it becomes thorium, and this little alpha particle, or helium nucleus, goes poof, and pops out. Okay? Kind of cool. Okay? Uranium, by the way, thorium will also do the same thing. And that'll become another one. It might not be alpha, it might be beta. I'll show you a, a picture of this in a little bit. But it's kind of it's neat. That was alpha radiation. Beta emission also happens. If you, if you release a, uh, just an electron, you don't change the mass. Remember how tiny electrons are? We don't even worry about them when we talk about mass. If you have a beta decay, no mass changes. But remember how I said beta particles, when they decay, it's when a neutron turns into a proton? Thorium, which is what we just got last time, right? Last time we started with thorium here, 9234. Thorium says, I'm not very stable. I'm going to eject an electron and turn one of my neutrons into a proton. The mass doesn't stay the same. Look at the mass, 144 plus 90. Isn't that the same as 143 plus 91? Same thing. There's that electron shooting away. But look, a neutron turned into a proton. The atomic number, it went up one on the periodic table. It went from thorium to whatever PA is. Uh, what is PA? I forget. Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. I don't know what it is. It's not <laughs> Pennsylvania, but that's kind of funny. Palladium or something like that? Anyway, palladium? Palladium. Maybe that's it. Palladium? Yeah, palladium? palladium? I don't know. Anyway, that's beta, beta decay. And all that's happening, a neutron flips into a proton, shoots out an electron, goes one up in the periodic table. Hmm. By the way, remember those neutrinos I was talking about? Turns out, when the physicists looked at this, they said, well, it almost works out. We do all the calculations, and it almost works out. There's just a tiny bit missing. Somebody said, well, let's make it some other particle. And other people were like, that's ridiculous. You can't just make up particles like that. And one guy, and some people said, look, the math works out if you make up this other particle. Well, they made it up. They used it. It seemed to work out. In the end, they figured out those really do exist. So one of those cases where 
Well, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. And that's where the neutrinos came from. This happens to be an anti-neutrino, which um, is, has a different quality than a regular neutrino, but it's still almost minuscule. Don't worry about that. We're not going to talk about the details. So here's that little chart I was going to tell you about. Uranium becomes thorium. Thorium, and this one, alpha decay. Thorium becomes this, whatever it is, palladium or whatever, becomes, uh, that's because of a beta decay. Palladium becomes uranium again, <laughs> another beta decay, but a different isotope of uranium. This uranium becomes thorium again. Thorium becomes radium. Radium becomes radon. Radon becomes uh, whatever this one is, polonium or something or whatever. Polonium does two things. It can either become whatever AT is or become, become lead. Lead can become bismuth. Bismuth can become PO again, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Ends up down at lead again with only 206 atomic mass. Turns out all uranium will eventually turn into lead. Why? Because it goes through this whole process over time where it ends up as lead. A very low energy lead, by the way. Lead with 82 protons and whatever 206 minus 82 is, is very, very stable. That will not ra be radioactive anymore. So that was transmutation half-life? That was transmutation. Half-life is how long it takes uranium to jump down in this next one, really, to be half as much. OK? Right. So then it's not uranium anymore. Not uranium half anymore. Well, right. The uranium itself that you started with, it degrades into thorium. Whenever half is gone, that's 4.5 billion years, right? Then whatever, there's still uranium left, but the rest of it has its own half-life. So, OK. OK? That has its own half-life. This is, this, is uh, this is the transmutation like for uranium all the way to lead. Kind of cool. Okay, you can stare at that one in your book a little bit more if you want, a little later. Okay. <laughs> we do have artificial transmutation. This was this guy named uh, Ernest Rutherford. I don't know what happened with my spacing here. He's what? East Rutherford, New Jersey. I'm not sure it's named after him, but um, this guy was Scottish, I think. I think Rutherford was Scottish. Or maybe he was from New Zealand and then lived in Scotland. I forget. I think that's him. Anyway, he, in 1919, he did this experiment with this thing called a cloud chamber. Okay? And what he did was he bombarded nitrogen with helium nuclei, with alpha particles. Okay? And what he did was, in this container, he all of a sudden found some oxygen and some hydrogen. And he said, what's going on? And his lab, one of the other guys in his lab said, that's transmutation. <laughs> and Rutherford first said, don't call it that. They'll think our, we're alchemists and they'll call us crazy. <laughs> but the term stuck. And so it's transmutation. We've actually created 93, atomic number 93, all the way up to 115 by these bombarding methods. Okay? But here's what he did. This one looks somewhat familiar. Helium hits the nitrogen. We get an oxygen, and we get a proton out of it, a hydrogen. And that's what happens. So how do we get H2O? Okay. Uh, that is not how we get H2O. But um, yeah, maybe he did notice some water vapor or something. I'm not sure. You might, once these guys are there, you'll get a hydrogen. And two, if two oxygens came together, you'd get, uh, is it H2O? Sorry, two hydrogens and an oxygen. So two hydrogens and then an oxygen. OK? All right. Check question. You ready for this? When an element spits out an alpha particle, what happens to the resulting element? Does the atomic number go down by two, go up by, go down by four, increase by two, or increase by four? Increase by two. Atomic number is the number of protons. If you got rid of two of them, goes down by two. Okay. Good job. All right. There's your cloud chamber. I don't exactly know how cloud chambers work. I didn't, didn't look it up. But cloud chambers, basically, when you shoot particles in there, okay, 
there's uh, electric fields in there and whatever. When you shoot particles in there and you bombard other particles off, off each other, when they, when they transmute and when they uh, decay into other particles, you can see the traces of them in these cloud chambers. If you take a picture of it, you can tell, for instance, hey, a particle going this way must be curving, so it must be a like alpha particle if it's curving this way. If something curved the other way, it could be a beta particle. Like, see how this one's curving the other way? It might be a beta particle. OK? Yeah, because it's not, not straight. And we get lots and lots of discoveries of new particles from these cloud chambers. Kind of cool stuff. Okay. All right. You guys have heard of radiometric dating before? How you use uh, the fact that there are radiation, there's radiation to, what's wrong? You haven't heard of this? You never heard of it? Oh, well, dating, you, yeah, if, <laughs> different kind of dating. Um, no, this what radiometric dating means is that we can tell how old something is by measuring the quantities of certain radioactive elements in those objects. Okay. Carbon dating we use to date plants and animals. Now, here's what's going on with carbon dating. In the atmosphere, in the sun, when some rays, cosmic rays, hit the at upper atmosphere, okay, there's carbon up there, okay, and when the carbon gets hit by these rays, sometimes the carbon goes from carbon 12, which is the most abundant, in other words, six protons, six neutrons, it ends up as carbon 14. So some of the, a certain percentage of carbon in the world is carbon 14. Carbon-14 happens to be radioactive. Okay? You, every day, are breathing in carbon. And in fact, most of your body is made of carbon. You're a carbon-based life form. Lots of carbon. Okay? If you've got carbon-14 in you, while you're breathing, you're continually replacing any carbon-14 that decays. Okay? So you get that? Carbon-14 is in your body. It decays. But you're constantly breathing more carbon-14, which is replacing the carbon-14. When you die, you stop breathing. I don't know if that's a surprise to everybody. But when you stop breathing, you stop replacing that carbon. The carbon-14 decays, decays, decays. And if you're not replacing it, over time, there's going to be less and less and less. We know what the half-life of carbon is. It's about 5,760 years. We can predict roughly how much carbon is in somebody's body when they die. It has to do with the, amount of, the average amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere. Now, it turns out that that changes over time. Way back, like millions of years ago, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere might have been different than now. But Within the like 50,000 years from uh, uh, 50,000 years ago, we can get this pretty well. So what this means is something dies. 40,000 years ago, something died. It had X number of carbon molecules in it. Some percentage were carbon-14. If today we measure the carbon-14, and we can do that using like Geiger counters that measure radioactivity, we can measure how much carbon-14 is in a skeleton or a fossil. We know, how much there, we know how much there is. We know how much there should have been when, that, when, when something died. Okay? We can use this to say, OK, 5,760 years ago, there'd be twice as much. Another 10,000 years ago or 11,000 years ago, there'd be four times as much, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You work it back doing a little bit of math, and you can say, this should have had this bone should have had so much carbon in it, carbon-14, but it only had this much. You can predict how old that bone is. Pretty cool stuff. Okay? That works great for living things within the last 50,000 years or so, something that was living within the last 50,000 years. Turns out rocks and metals don't breathe. Another surprise, right? They don't breathe. You can't use carbon-14 dating for those items. You can use uh, uranium, which you've all got some uranium in your body, 
most likely. Or you could use, but, but things like rocks and things will have a certain percentage, might be uranium or lead. Okay? And you can figure out how much you can use those to date them. And it's actually for a much longer span of time because the half life of uranium is actually 4 billion years. Yeah? So, how about fossils that were living but are rocks now? Uh, fossils that were living but rocks, again, if it's more than 50,000 years, we have to use some other method. Possibly lead dating, but uranium dating, probably not so much. There's other ways to do it, but this is a pretty, pretty good way to do relatively so recent all things. These figures they're pretty accurate. Now, if you look at if you look at something, you say this bone is you know forty thousand years old. It'll say forty thousand plus or minus some amount. That reminds me. That reminds me of my favorite science joke. So, forgot about. It. All right, here's my favorite science joke. So, two guys walk into a natural science museum, dinosaurs and things. Okay, they walk up to this Tyrannosaurus Rex, and the one guy looks, turns to the other guy and goes, that dinosaur is a million and four years old. It's a million and four years old. And the other guy looks at him and goes, how do you know it's a million and four years old? And the first guy goes, well, I came here four years ago and they told me it was a million years old. <laughs> right? And that's actually a joke about significant digits. It's also a joke about this kind of, like, rounding, right? You can't say that something's exactly a million years old. You can say it's a million, a hundred thousand years from now, it's still going to be a million years old. When does it turn two million? A hundred and a million point five, right? 1.5 million years ago, then we round up to two million. So it all depends on how accurate you can be. For things like radioactive dating, you might get to within a thousand years or maybe 500 years or something like that. But you won't get closer than that. Because you're not exactly sure how much rate, how much carbon it had to begin with. You can get close, but you're not exactly sure. Make sense? What about for humans when they died and stuff, the ejected of the body from their dead? Doesn't that like play a factor in like kind of screwing the numbers up? Maybe? When humans die, oh, you mean like when you embalm them? Yeah. Uh, that may that that probably won't. No, so the carbon 14 is going to decay no matter what. You can't remember you can't change decay by chemical means. You can't do it. It's just going to decay no matter what. And if you're not adding more, now, if you somehow injected them with carbon-14, all right, different story. But you know, over time, if you start injecting them with more carbon-14, yeah, different story. But that's probably not what's happening. Probably that's what the pharaohs did. The, the pharaohs did inject them with stuff, I think. But it wasn't carbon-14. Might have been carbon, but you know, I don't know. So anyway, you can use this to do this radiometric dating. OK? Kenneth, you OK? Yeah. All right, you ready? You've got an archaeological dig. It uncovers an ancient spear with a wooden handle. And wood, remember, was living. So how we can carbon date it. It contains one eighth of the radioactive carbon of a fresh piece of wood. Okay? Let's do some what we call back of the envelope calculations. Half life of carbon was what? 5,760 years. So if it contains one eighth, Okay. How old is the spear? One eighth of what it should. You can do this in your head. If it was, if it was half. Okay. If it only contained half, how old would it be? Five thousand seven hundred sixty. If it contained a quarter, how old would it be? About eleven thousand. If it contained an eighth, how much would it be? 17,280. Is that what you got when you did 5,760 times 3? Yep. Did you, did you guys fig see how we figured that out? We just kind of worked backwards. OK, so let's see. Boop. 7,280 years. Oops. I moved, moved up. OK? 7,280 years old. One half life by half, two is a quarter, three is one eighth. That's how we did it. Good. Yeah, that's how you do it. It's pretty cool. OK, aha. Now we are on to nuclear fission. Okay. I read a book a few years ago. Actually, I was taking a class on, uh, what was it on? It was on, it was on relativity. 
but relativity has to do with energy, and energy and fission is all about energy. We read this book. Highly, highly suggest when you are not reading two chapters a week for physics and chemistry class, pick up this book. You can get it off Amazon or you can get it on your Kindle or whatever. It is a phenomenal book. It's about that thick. It's like really thick. But it's an easy read and it goes through all the history of how all this stuff we've been talking about today happened. Like the first guys that figured out transmutation, the guys who figured out uh, fission, which we're going to talk about in a second, the guys who built the atomic bomb, the guys who rallied against the atomic bomb when they dropped the atomic bomb. Great book. Okay, Richard Rhodes. Okay, I'll put a link on Amazon. Or I'll put a link on the website to the Amazon, book, Amazon page. Um, but anyway, I really suggest it. And I don't work for this guy. I just think it was a great book. Okay? Nuclear fission was what the first atomic bombs were based on. Today's bombs are based on nuclear fusion, not nuclear fission. We'll get to that. OK, nuclear fission. So we talked about all this decay stuff, right? Decay is kind of a one-off sort of thing. It's when a particle shoots out a, 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 an alpha particle, or an a, a element shoots out an alpha particle, or a beta particle, or something like that. Nuclear fission is when you get an actual splitting of an atom. That's what we talk about when we talk about splitting the atom, right? If you have uranium-235, remember that's the one that we use to create nuclear bombs? If you happen to have a neutron that comes up to a uh, uranium-235 atom, and it's going slow enough to get absorbed, it will actually cause this atom to become very unstable and then break into two parts. One part happens to be krypton, like kryptonite, but krypton, right? The other part is baryon, or barium, I guess it is, barium, OK? And it releases three neutrons. Hmm, interesting. This is called fission. What do you think we do with those neutrons? Well, we do kind of harness them. They're moving kind of fast, OK? When they get released here, they're moving kind of fast. We, get, we tap out some of that energy. But if we slow them down enough, and there happens to be another uranium particle nearby, what can happen? It can hit that one. And that one breaks into a krypton and a, a barium and releases three neutrons. And what happens if there's another? And you slow it down enough. Same thing. That is actually called a chain reaction. Yes, absolutely, Tom. I'm going to show you that over here. I know this is like a couple slides away. But take a look at this. Okay, I'm going to log on again, of course. Uh, not shift alt delete, control alt delete. There we go. OK, so this is what we're talking about here. See the little neutron up here? And all these uraniums, we only need that one little neutron with all these uraniums around to start this process. Neutron, boom, hits the uranium. Look, three neutrons. Hits another uranium, three neutrons. Hits another uranium, three neutrons, and lots of other particles. And by the way, those all things are going pretty fast there. And that's called a chain reaction. Huh. So the neutrons don't okay. do anything to the uranium or the um, It may. It may do something to the other two, but I'm not sure. The one that counts is the uranium. Yeah. You get enough uraniums together, you can, you can do this. Okay? When people figured this out in like the 1930s, this was, talk about revolutionary. This was revolutionary. Because people immediately thought, holy smokes, we can actually create a bomb. And we can maybe create power out of this stuff. And it was amazing. right? And it was lots of different people figured this out. It wasn't like it was just the Americans who figured it out. Some Germans figured it out, right? Russians figured it out. Lots of people figured this out. It happened to be the Americans who were fast enough to get the first bomb. But otherwise, you want to see that again? Chain reaction. It took them uh, It took them about five years, maybe six. Okay, there you go. The Manhattan Project. Yeah, that, that book, by the way, talks all about that stuff. 
Okay, oops, let me see, hang on, they're all on. Was it the Manhattan Project in L.A. in New Mexico? Uh, the Manhattan Project was in uh, New Mexico, yes. Yep. So let's see if we can look at fission here. Uh, okay, let's see which one we have here. Ah, yeah. one of the things about fission, so we split the atom. One of the interesting things about this is you know how those, we, we show that those, those neutrons go pretty fast. And uh, the other two particles actually go kind of fast, too. Turns out that if you measure the mass, so here's a uranium. Can you guys see that? Here's a uranium atom. And here's a neutron. Okay? If you put these guys on a scale, boop, and boop, put those on a scale. And this is the krypton, and this is the barium, or it might be the other way around, and three little neutrons. You put those on a scale, what should they, what should happen? Should, should balance out, right? Whoops, come on. Okay, so let's see. We put, nope, oh, almost. One more, and one more. Boop. It's still heavier. Why is it still heavier? Because we released energy. The energy was in the form of those particles moving a little faster than they should have. Okay? This formula, the formula that we relate this to, is something that you guys all know, and every kid in the world knows. Energy equals mc squared. What's happening is we are turning mass into energy. In terms, in this case, kinetic energy. Okay, that energy is what we're harnessing to give us nuclear power and nuclear bombs. Okay, E equals mc squared. We're not going to worry. Quite, we're going to worry in a little. We're going to do this in a few minutes about going into some details about this. But that's what's going on. Okay. Let's see if there's another one here. Uh, let's see. Fission and mass 2, I think, is the same one here. Let's see. This one is something. Oh, oh, sorry. This is fusion and mass. I'll just give you a little hint here. Fusion is when we start out with a, we, we start out with two, I guess we start out with hydrogens, and they become a helium. This is your helium, and this is your hydrogen, and your other hydrogen, and that one weighs more because you're fusing things together and releasing energy. So it's the one where you end up with less energy, or less mass, because some of that mass turned into energy. So if you turn the helium into two hydrogens? The hydrogen act, you have to add energy to it to make that happen. Yeah. Yeah, question. Yeah, question. No question? Oh, OK. Uh, let's see, what was this? This was uh, fission of plutonium. So by the way, this, uh, sorry, that is, this says plutonium. That looks like uranium to me. Maybe this becomes plutonium. Let's see what this one's going on here. Oh, there we go. Can shoot out an electron, become neptunium. Shoot out another electron, become plutonium. And then finally, the plutonium gets a neutron and splits into boom, 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 and three neutrons. So. The plutonium is the one that we care about when we want to make nuclear bombs. Okay? This is actually the second nuclear bomb was made of plutonium. Now, okay. now for power, they use the uh, enriched uranium, right? They do. They use uranium-238. Okay. No, sorry. Uranium-235. Okay. Now, is there okay. a byproduct from that? Uh, there is. It's thorium and barium, and then all the other particles that are created in there. It's very radioactive, in fact. Let's see if I can get this to work. Come on. Uh, they need nuclear power. They need what? What was the question? Enriched uranium. Yes. And they use that to enrich the uranium yes. to 
You mean the you mean like the Iranians, who yeah. are creating? Right. Yes, they they are. We did the same thing. I mean, we have different ways of doing it, but um, <clears throat> yes, they need to take uranium two thirty eight. Well, they take uranium. Part of it's uranium two thirty eight, which doesn't help us much. Yeah. The other part is uranium two thirty five, which is in very small quantities. They use these centrifuges to spin the particles around. The heavy ones go to the end. You throw those away because those are 238s. You keep the lighter ones, which are 235s. And if you get enough of them together, you can create a chain reaction. And then you get nuclear power and so nuclear bomb. There's no really use for. Um, I, I forget. I want to say that we use 238. I want to say that we use 238 for nuclear power. But I may be wrong. See, that's, I think we use 238 for nuclear power. When, I may be wrong about that. When I first started in the intel field, I was an Iranian. Mm -hmm. And that was the big thing in, in 2008, 2009 was, I mean, it's still a big deal. It's just not in the news very much, is the Iranians you know, building nuclear power plants. Yes. And you know, we, we, we said, OK, we will trade you uranium that you have for enriched uranium that can only be used as a in nuclear power. Right, right. Okay, so I'm reading this right here on, on Wikipedia. It says, U-238 is not usable directly as nuclear fuel, though it can produce energy via fast fission. In this process, a neutron that has kinetic energy in excess of one mega electron volt can cause the nucleus of U-238 to split into two. So. Uh, you can use 238 to create plutonium, which we can use in bombs. We have what we call a call a breeder reactor to do that. And let's see. So I guess, I guess I was wrong. It's 235, which, let's see. Let's see if 235 is the one we use in reactors, too. Um, I, I did about a, well, it was supposed to be a 15 minute briefing yeah. on all of this. Oh, it was all about that. OK. Well, anyway, we use uranium. I think it's 238 for both fission and, or for fission reactors and for, um, for uh, bombs, yeah. the older kind of bombs. And yeah, that was one of the things that we were, we were getting way into yep. the, <laughs> into the weeds. Yeah. OK. So take a look at this. So here's the, here's the reason we lose the mass, right? We get kinetic energy, OK? And we get those energy that the, the, the neutrons fly away in. And we also get some gamma radiation. Okay? The gamma radiation doesn't really help us much. It might heat up the water like the, a little bit, but it doesn't, doesn't help us too much. <clears throat> okay? One of the ways, at least in the US reactors, we actually need to slow down those. Remember, it's the slow neutrons that make it so that we can do this fission. One of the ways we slow them down is we use water. Okay? And the, the, as the neutrons go through water, they tend to slow down. And then they can keep this chain reaction. If you drain all the water out of a nuclear reactor, you're not going to get any more nuclear fission because any radioactivity will actually be, the, the neutrons will be too fast. And they won't get captured by other neutrons or other uranium. Okay, here's the chain reaction we talked about. Self-sustaining self reaction. The problem with a self-sustaining reaction is you need some way to moderate it. The way you moderate these things is by, like, um, you can use uh, different materials that absorb neutrons. Makes it easy. Okay. Why what? What was the question, Nicholas? No question. Oh, okay. Sorry. You can't just get a chain reaction with a small amount of uranium. You need what we call a critical mass. In other words, you need a certain amount of uranium to create enough of a chain, enough of these reactions to keep that rea chain reaction going. Okay? In a nuclear reactor, we have it all in a big in a big area, and we put these rods down there to keep the uh, reaction from going out of control. Okay? Anybody ever heard of the term "scram the reactor"? You guys aren't submariners, are you? You've heard of it before? Back when submarines, the first nuclear power plants were really on submarines, 
And the first submarines had a reactor that had these big, long moderation uh, uh, rods that would drop into the reactor. And they were connected by a rope. Okay? And the rope, you could let the rope down slowly into the reactor, or you could, and you could pull it up pretty slowly. But if it got to a point where there, something went wrong, you wanted to release those rods just like that so the reaction would stop before it melted the reactor. Right? You get a meltdown. Well, they actually had a guy there who stood next to these ropes with an axe. He was a sailor. His job was the, to sit there, the axe man, right? So I would sit there, and then if the little red light went off and the, no, and the, like the, the loud sounds, he was to step over there and he was just to cut all those lines so that the things would go foom, straight into the thing. They called that guy the supercritical reactor axe man. Scram, right? And so that was the thing. Now, I have no idea if this is a true story. <laughs> supposedly there was this guy with the, they had a, like an axe there to do this. But supposedly that's a story. So to scram the reactor means you have to do it fast and so you cut the ropes. Now these days they have a button that they push or they have a guy that like, you know, does something else, but that's what happens. He definitely, what's that? The other right. right. In a nuclear bomb, what they generally do is they have some of the uranium and they have another piece of uranium that comes in and smacks into that first piece, which makes enough mass to keep to start the chain reaction, which causes the explosion. In the first bomb, they actually had a, the piece of uranium, and they had a rifle with a uranium bullet. And they shot the bullet, and it had to go perfectly in there, and boom, that was what happened. Isn't that cool? Whoa. What happened? To the, it all got demolished. It was like. It was like a billion degrees instantly. <laughs> yeah. So how does a dirty bomb work? Uh, a, a dirty bomb. Good question. A dirty bomb is basically you're not necessarily creating a chain reaction. You're just taking a radioactive material and exploding it so that it, the, it, fallout. the fallout is, is dirty. Yeah. Yeah. OK? All right. By the way, um, the first critical mass was called a nuclear pile. It happened underneath the stadium at the University of Chicago by a guy named Enrico Fermi, who was a famous Italian physicist who figured it out. He had all the calculations. And he's like, OK, if you put one more little bit of uranium in there, we're going to have exactly the right amount. What's that? And here, let's try it. Well, he did. They tried it, but they had the rods that they knew. And they, they, they had it all perfect. But the book that I talked about describes it. It's really cool. OK. Check question from the beginning of class. Uranium-235, 238, and 239 are different what? Elements, ions, isotopes, or nucleons? Isotopes. Good. Okay. Get that question right in the final. All right, here we are. E equals mc squared. Albert Einstein comes up with this formula. It has to, happens to be a footnote of his special relativity thing. Okay. He took a look at this and went, uh-oh. You know what this means? We can make nuclear bombs. I don't know if he did that, but people very quickly realized this was it. Mass is congealed energy. A weird way of putting it, but where it is. World famous equation, key to understanding why energy is released in nuclear reactions. We already talked about that when we weighed those two particles, or those sets of particles. The stuff you start with weighs less than the, or sorry, more than the stuff you end with, meaning some of that mass was turned into energy. Pretty cool. Okay? The more energy for the particle, the greater the mass. The mass of a nucleon outside the nucleus is greater than the mass inside. So when masses come together into a nucleus, they actually, they actually uh, gain mass. Okay? The greater the mass of the nucleon, the energy required is, is really the amount of energy it takes to pull them apart or to squish two, two tiny ones together. Okay? All right. <clears throat> when nucleons lose mass, in other words, what we talk about is when they lose mass, <clears throat> the change in mass multiplied by the square of the speed of light. C in this formula is the speed of light. Is the speed of light big or small? It's huge. The speed of light squared is really huge. That's why you get lots of energy from a small amount of mass. Because you're actually multiplying times a huge, huge, huge number. Okay? One base, I think I've got a slide on this later. One baseball-sized piece of uranium has as much energy as like 30 
train load fulls of coal. One baseball size. Train cars, yeah, train cars, right? Okay, all right. Here's how a reactor works, by the way. This is a fission reactor. This is at your nuclear power plant. Okay, this is what happens. You've got the, it's actually pretty simple when it comes down to it. The, the big idea is it's pretty simple. We take the uranium, okay? We boil water. That's all we do with it. All those fast elect neutrons boils water with a chain reaction. You boil the water, you take the water, you make it go through this thing here that does this thing called heat exchange with other water. The reason you do that is because all this stuff is really irradiated. You don't want this stuff in your main reactor. You want to limit it as much as you can. So you keep it in this, you get another boiler which is also boils. You get steam. That steam goes into a turbine, just like a, any other steam engine, <clears throat> turns a generator, which we talked about from electricity class. That generator produces electricity. You pump it out to the power lines, good to go. And then what do you do? You have to condense that steam, and you have to pump it back in here, and you have to, con you have to pump the, the other boiling water back and whatever. But that's how a nuclear reactor works. We, we use uranium to boil water. That boiling water produces steam. That steam goes through a turbine. We get electricity. Ta-da! Right? It all works that way. That's a very simplified version. It's a very simplified version, sure. But if you didn't want to use nuclear power, you could use coal to heat the water, which turns the turbine, which does the same thing. Or you could use a you could use diesel fuel, like we do here, or whatever, right? Same thing. If you want to replace the diesel fuel with the nuclear reactor, fine. I don't think the Jabushans would love it, but you never know. Yeah, you can go directly from diesel to generator, too. You can go diesel to generator, sure. No. You don't have to do the steam, yeah, you're right. OK, that's fission. Then we have nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion is when you take light nuclei and you cram them together, OK? And when you cram them together, you end up with heavier nuclei, but you get energy. Okay? You actually get energy out of the when you combine them together. Okay? In the sun, we have nuclear reactions, nuclear fusion. Okay? And what's happening there is there's so much gravity, it's able to force that hydrogen together, creating helium, releasing energy. Okay? With enough time, the sun ends up becoming iron. Because it creates, it fuse, 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 fuse. You get to iron, no more fusion. Okay? Someday we should have fusion reactors that are not bad. Okay? Check question. When energy is released by fission or fusion, the total mass of the material after the event is less, the same, more, or none of the above? Less, because some energy was released. Okay? So does that make sense here? What did we say here? Combination of nuclei that form heavier nuclei with the release of more of much energy. Uh, right. Form heavier nuclei. You've got a heavy nucleus, but the total mass of that is actually less than it was before you started. Because you released some energy. Okay. And less. The name of the game for energy is lose mass. You lose mass, you get energy. You put it into a steam boiler, you get electricity. Woohoo. Right? Problem is you also get a bunch of radiation, like radioactive material that you have to dispose of, but that's for the hippies to deal with. No, I'm just kidding. That's for all of us to deal with, really, right? I mean, we have to, we have to, one of the byproducts of nuclear clean energy, nuclear fusion, is very unclean byproduct, you know, uh, well, waste. It, so. every, everything has that. Coal, sure. Solar even has that, too. Sure. Yeah, so. it does. Okay. All right. I'm letting you out 10 minutes early. I will have, somebody will email me and remind me to put up the uh, questions for the uh, test. Study for the test on Saturday, the midterm. Okay, you'll do fine. It's only going to take maybe 45 minutes. Okay. Is it time? It's time.